Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to start our conversation with Captain Benny Blanco and Captain Lucas Bissett momentarily. And we just uh, want to give a few minutes for folks to join. Today's conversation is called Facing a Climate Crisis in the Sport Fishing Capital of the World. And it focuses on climate related impacts in particular to fishing in Florida. Our guests today are working on a film series highlighting the climate impacts to fisheries in the southeastern United States with a specific focus on Floridian fisheries. And we will be talking about their expertise as professional charter captains and what they are seeing personally on the water. Um, a note that this presentation is being pre-recorded, so I'll include my contact information so viewers can reach out with questions or comments about the conversation afterwards. And again, we're just taking a minute to get started and we'll be starting our conversation with Captain Benny Blanco and Captain Lucas Bissett in just a minute. Um, we're giving folks just a, mi a minute longer to join. Um, these two charter captains are well-renowned in their field and uh, are excited to talk to you about what they've been seeing on the water in Florida and around the Southeastern US. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. I'll introduce myself. My name is JP Brooker. I'm the director of Florida Conservation for Ocean Conservancy. I'm a sixth generation Floridian and I was born and raised in Brevard County, Florida. I grew up on the Indian River Lagoon, which is where I developed a passion for marine conservation from an early age. I'm an attorney, I'm admitted to the Florida Bar, and I sit on the Coral Advisory Panel for the Gulf of Mexico Fishery Management Council and on the Executive Council of the Florida Bar's Environmental and Land Use Law Section. And I'm based in St. Petersburg, Florida. Ocean Conservancy is the nation's oldest marine conservation organization, and we were founded in 1972. We're headquartered in Washington, D.C., and we have offices in Alaska, Washington, Oregon, California, Texas, and Florida. Our offices in Florida and St. Pete and in Miami. We work at the nexus of science and policy, and that's reflected in the composition of Ocean Conservancy staff, which is a mix of scientists, policy wonks, lawyers, um, each person within the organization dedicated to achieving meaningful protections for our ocean planet. For more than three decades, we've worked in Florida on the full spectrum of marine conservation issues, including harmful algal blooms, water quality and abundance, marine wildlife and habitat, marine debris and ocean plastic, oil and gas, and of course, fisheries. But of course, we've been working to tell the story of climate impacts in Florida for a very long time. And we've highlighted how sea level rise is impacting municipal infrastructure like streets and stormwater treatment facilities. We've talked about how climate gentrification is impacting low income communities and communities of color and how poor neighborhoods in Florida are facing the full force of climate change as their local infrastructure is not equipped to deal with rising seas. We've talked about the impacts of more frequent and more severe tropical weather on both the human and natural environments. And we're also increasingly working to tell the story of climate impacts to fisheries. And that's what brings us here today uh, to talk with Captains Blanco and Bissett about climate impacts to fisheries and what they've seen in Florida. And fisheries are so important to Florida. Florida is the sport fishing capital of the world and more than 200,000 jobs are sustained by fishing alone. Commercial, recreational, and for hire fleets are integral to the coastal identity of the state and the coastwide economy as well. And each of those fleets needs an underpinning of thriving and sustainable fish stocks. As a result of climate change, fish stocks are changing distribution and moving toward cooler waters. The Gulf of Mexico is three degrees warmer on average than it has been historically. And this has significantly altered the migration patterns of stocks like king and Spanish mackerel. These fish just aren't showing up in the same places and at the same times as we would typically expect. But shifting stocks aren't the only impact on fish. Some are becoming less productive, less abundant, and are less resilient to other threats like pollution and habitat degradation. Fisheries are affected by climate change and fishery dependent coastal economies and indigenous communities and cultures are particularly vulnerable. 
For fisheries, climate change could mean changes like lower catches, less stability, emerging and shifting fisheries, loss of traditional target species, new bycatch interactions, more extreme events and disasters, and impacts to ports and other fishing infrastructure. It can also mean fisheries moving into previously in unfished areas with impacts on the ecosystem and communities. So that's a long preamble to finally get to the substance of our conversation, a conversation with Captain Benny Blanco and Captain Lucas Bissett. Benny is an ardent conversation at con conservationist who happens to also be a world-class light tackle fishing guide and accomplished tournament pro operating charters from Isla Morada to Everglades National Park in Florida. He is a prolific voice for conservation in Florida and has worked with groups like Ocean Conservancy, Everglades Foundation, and Captains for Clean Water, among many others. And he's been seen on many top sports networks and is the host of Guiding Flow TV, which airs on Waypoint TV and which we will be talking about and seeing a clip from later. Lucas is an outspoken advocate on fisheries issues and climate change in his home state of Louisiana, as well as across the United States. He is the vice chair of the board of directors of the American Fly Fish Trade Association, which is referred to as AFTA, and is chair of AFTA's Fisheries Fund, which supports conservation initiatives. Lucas founded Anglers Bettering Louisiana's Estuaries, which works on coastal restoration projects and runs low tide charters out of Hopedale, Louisiana. And he was the Orvis endorsed saltwater guide of the year for 2017. So welcome guys. Thank you so much for joining me. And let's start with Benny. Benny, how is climate change already affecting the fisheries that are important to you in Florida? And what are you seeing on the water? Yeah, thank you for having me, JP. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about these issues because we don't get a lot of opportunities to do so. Um, climate change is absolutely affecting everything we do down here. I mean, every single business down here revolves around the health of the water and the, the migratory species that come through down here, like tarpon, you know, bonefish and permit and how they move in and out in the seasons. And um, climate change is affecting those time, that, that timing. Um, the timing, their availability, um, the, the abundance, um, and, you know, with, with those issues compounded by the pollution issues that we already have that are very well known that we speak about all the time, um, it becomes very clear and evident that those, those, are, those are resulting from climate change. Yeah. And Lucas, similar question to you. How is climate change affecting your fisheries in Louisiana? And follow up question to that. Have you seen anything in Louisiana, Louisiana that would pose a similar threat in Florida or nationwide? What can we learn from Louisiana and take elsewhere? Yeah, and uh, I wanna thank you as well for having me on and, and giving me the opportunity to speak about something that I care so much about. Um, yeah, in Louisiana, we're definitely dealing with many different issues that are directly related to climate change. Um, here in Louisiana, we're basically ground zero for habitat loss in the country. Um, unfortunately, Louisiana is losing land at a more rapid rate than anywhere else, and climate change and rising sea levels are definitely contributing to that and, and expediting the process. Um, with that, we're losing, you know, vital nurseries. We're losing, you know, areas for these fish to stay during the winter in order to make sure that they're protected from cooler, climate, um, cooler climates, as well as, uh, you know, last year being a prime example of more and, and more severe hurricanes that are, are also expediting the process of, of land loss. Um, we're also seeing water coming down the Mississippi River at a much heavier rate than it used to be. And with agriculture runoff and other uh, sort of detriments, we are seeing a, a dead zone that is growing at an alarming rate. Um, you know, having an opportunity to go to Florida recently and fish with Benny, uh, I definitely see where there are very, very similar um, sort of problems that we're facing in Florida and Louisiana. To me, it, it speaks to the global nature of climate change. It speaks to the fact that we're all in this together. Uh, when I was there, we talked about grass bed loss in Biscayne Bay. Uh, I know that was directly related to water quality issues and again is being expedited by, by climate change. And that's exactly what we're facing here is habitat loss, destruction of habitat, and with that, the loss of, of fishing and you know, fish uh, abundant opportunities. And so um, many similarities between our states, not just because they're both amazing world-renowned fisheries, but also because we're experiencing major loss due to, due to climate change. 
Yeah, definitely. And and the habitat loss issue is something of you know significant concern in Florida. And I think about how um, mangroves are really a walking tree, and they'll go wherever the habitat seems right for them. But what that means, and it sounds like a good thing, right, Benny? It sounds like a good thing to have mangroves expanding their habitat, and we have new mangrove trees where we didn't before. But you know, we're losing something as those mangroves uh, walk up the coast. They take over the Spartina salt marsh or move into the Everglades. And I'm wondering if you've seen that firsthand, Benny, in the glades where you fish or, or up the coast as you've been filming your show. Yeah, I've seen it on both ends of the spectrum, JP. You know, we, we are in, you go towards Biscayne Bay and we're losing mangroves to urban development. And that's a major issue. Then the other issue is inside the Everglades, you know, one of the, the part, main park row when you're driving into Flamingo, you can see the foliage change um, as you get down towards salt water. And the mangroves are certainly much further inland and uh, that's a, a, I mean, a point blank two plus two equals four uh, indication that sea level rise and, and climate change is affecting how our entire estuary survives. Um, and so I, I, you know, without a doubt, you, everywhere you look down here, you can see, you know, firsthand effects of, of climate change and sea level rise. Yeah, and you know, a lot of people don't think about those impacts of a, just something as simple as a tree shifting out of its natural habitat and taking over some new habitat. but. You know, you think about um, uh, bird rookeries that rely on fresh water and rely on little tiny freshwater fish that live up in the sawgrass. And now that's a mangrove habitat. So where do those baby birds grow up and raise up? if They're not um, in their natural habitat. So it's definitely alarming, um, even though it, to the untrained eye, to someone who doesn't necessarily have that experience on the water um, or in the Everglades, it may not be so obvious. But I want to ask you guys, to both of you, um, you're working on uh, this breakout series within Guiding Flow and Ocean Conservancy is working with you guys to highlight the impacts that you're seeing on the water from climate change and impacts that are affecting the fisheries that you care deeply about. And we'll talk uh, more after we watch a clip about the actual places you'll be going in the series. But I wanted to ask both of you, maybe first Benny and then Lucas, what you hope to accomplish with the series and what it is that you hope that viewers take away after they watch it? Sure. Um, you know, there's so many things we want to do with every episode, um, but, the, but the two primary objectives are, one, to put climate change and sea level rise on the map within our industry. Um, it's important that we start talking about it everywhere. Um, and, and, and at the same time, it is a unifying issue. Uh, and the other component of, to this, this effort is that we want to unify all of our communities. You know, we, we are not, you know, localized in this fight. This is a, a one community, one, you know, everyone together um, fight. And, you know, the first thing that we have to do is recognize that it is an issue throughout and to recognize that we're not alone and that we're all in this together. Yeah, and I, I think to add to that, you know, one of the things that I think we have an opportunity to do with this show is to really make sort of climate change digestible for the average person. I mean, I think that a lot of people see climate change and they hear the polarizing, you know, sort of aspects of it. What I want to do is I want to take that away from this fight. I want to I want to neutralize sort of the political part of it and make sure that people understand that as anglers, we're not Democrats, we're not Republicans. We're out there on the front lines experiencing this firsthand. And that if we can make a national conversation about it, then others will follow suit. The other thing that I think is extremely important with this is the fact that you're talking about climate change being really a connective thread that brings us all together, that we all are in the same boat and that you know rising tides do bring up all boats. And so if we can illustrate issues that we're facing here in our areas and then also bring those to other areas and show the connective nature of this, it gives us the opportunity to come together as one voice and really start to fight nationally when it comes to politics, when it comes to policy, and when it comes to protection. Yeah, absolutely. I love what both of you guys said. I mean, we are at all hands on deck moment. And, you know, I'm thinking about what's been going on in West Central Florida with this Piney Point crisis that's been unfolding before our eyes. and. You know, the response has been overwhelming. Everyone in the environmental community has stepped up, whether it's sportsmen's groups like Captains for Clean Water or it's uh, more mainstream environmental groups like Ocean Conservancy. And you really love to see everyone coalesce around an issue and try to find issues. Uh, 
sorry, solutions for that issue. Um, and, you know, I'm optimistic that, you know, we can do something um, positive for climate change also for the Piney Point crisis that's been unfolding. Um, and um, I just, I, I think it's, it's really poignant almost to see folks from across the political spectrum come together on a specific issue. Um, I couldn't agree with you more, Lucas, that, I mean, a fish doesn't care if you vote red or you vote blue. A fish doesn't know where you're from. And uh, what they care about is if, you know, their, their habitat's more saline or there used to be mangroves here and now there's uh, none or whatever the case may be, you know, I mean, I think it's really Im important that we make this as apolitical as possible because it is an all hands on deck moment. Um, so let's watch a clip from the last season of Guiding Flow TV, which went live in December of 2020. And it talks a lot about these issues um, that are going on in Florida's marine environment. And after the clip, we'll return with some more questions. As a kid, all I wanted to do was be near the water. I fell deeply for the fish and that salt air. Fishing was the mechanism, but the ocean and its prospect of endless opportunity was always the draw. I would lie awake at night, imagining what a life on the water meant. Some 30 years later, my alarm rings to find me already awake. The smell of coffee fills the kitchen and my day begins. This is the life I dreamt about so long ago. The earliest of mornings and the longest of days. Certainly not for everyone. I've seen so many come and go, and at times it seems like there's a new guide every single day, but they eventually fall victim to those long hours and demanding days. Me, this is what I was built for. Those days of dreaming about this life were over 30 years ago, and my family, like many Florida families, fought through those difficult beginning years of building a livelihood around the water. Now we are in the fight, quite literally, for our lives, as we race to become educated and educate those around us. The water and wild places that we love the very ones we built our lives around need a voice, our voice. While most of our fisheries are still world class, they are but a mere shell of what they once were. And it's time we break that shifting baseline curse and restore them for perpetuity. Shifting baseline is one of the biggest issues we face today. The next generation, the kids these days, don't understand what it is that we had five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 40 years ago. You take Biscayne, for example. I, I grew up fishing Biscayne Bay and the fishing that we had when I was a child just doesn't exist anymore. And that's what I'm fighting for. And it's very difficult to create a situation where the kids and the younger generation understand the value. I think back to a day I spent with one of my childhood heroes and someone who's got tons of time on the water here in South Florida, Chico Fernandez, a fly fishing legend. and. He tells stories of when he first came here from Cuba and how there were more bonefish in Biscayne Bay than there were anywhere else, including the Bahamas. You know, here, unlike other places, we had huge fish. Yeah. Key Biscayne had tailing bonefish, big fish, over 10 pounds. Um, this brackish water produces so much food for the bonefish. The biggest bonefish in the world are here. You get a bonefish in the Bahamas someplace else that measures uh, the same length, it's like three pounds lighter. Florida Bay sees a lot of anglers a year, and I don't mean a couple thousand. Right. So 
it's, ma it's a magical place and we have to preserve it no matter what. Thank you so much for coming out. Um, but most importantly, I'm thankful that you're willing to lend your voice to this cause, to, to raise awareness for what's going on. Absolutely, I'm 100% behind it. I know you are. Well, the, one of the reasons why I'm so active is because I would watch you and Flip when I was a kid. And, and one thing you always instilled in every single show, no matter what you were doing, it could be the record fish you were catching, you were still talking about how important the habitat was, how important to protect those fish were. And that, that was ingrained. And it's more important now. Yes, for sure. It's not now. just important, it's imperative. Right, coming at us. Yeah. Yeah, I see. The University of Miami did a study in 2016, and they came up with an estimate based on all of this calculations that every bonefish in the state of Florida is valued at approximately $3,500 each per year. So a bonefish, according to BTT, last lives about 20 years. So every right. bonefish is worth about $70,000 to the Florida economy. So I preach all the time that we have to take care of the species and the fish that we have because their value is far greater than the fact that you just caught that fish or the picture you're gonna get for social media. That, that fish has to survive, not just for you and for the next angler who's gonna catch it, but for the people who are coming here every now year. Sliding left, they're gonna cross the front of the boat. Nice, very good. Certainly the issues in Biscayne Bay have a lot to do with the major metropolitan city that abuts it. But Biscayne's also part of the Everglades system. Everything that happens in the Everglades affects Biscayne Bay. The water in Biscayne Bay is interconnected with the fresh water that needs to continue to flow south in Everglades National Park. One of my top goals for this show is to share the first-hand accounts of what our water and fisheries once were. The youngest generation of anglers need to fully understand what we are striving to restore. Another day I spent with Chico Fernandez in Everglades National Park. He recounted what Florida Bay was when we first saw it in the 1950s. And by all accounts, it was the bay for which all other bays are measured. Home to most of the bonefish and permanent world records and the birthplace for saltwater fly fishing. Uh, you tell someone you fly fish for snook, they'll call you a liar. You can't catch a snook with a fly rod. That, that's where that world was at. The first guy I met was Bill Curtis. And we started talking and I told him snook was my favorite fish. And he told me about the Tamiami Trail and how he could find snook with a, with a northern wind. The Tamiami Trail runs east and west and northern wind would push the water out and all the minnows out and, right. and you, you see the snook popping against the shoreline, occasionally tarpon. So I said, we can go now. <laughs> nice try. <laughs> you were like Zorro. Uh, he might have seen us by the time. He had to. He was right there. <laughs> he might have. <laughs> you could have poked him with the rod. <laughs> well, a few weeks later, I came in there, and there was this tall, skinny guy wiggling a rod. It was, it was Flip Pallet. Four and a half minutes later, we were like this, you right. know. You're at 11 to 10 o'clock, 20 feet left, short. Yep, right there, perfect, right on there. Sure, 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 got it. <laughs> Eventually, we met Norman Duncan and little John Emery. So the four of us were like the four musketeers, and we're the we started come up with pretty state-of-the-art stuff. 
simply because they didn't exist. And necessity is the mother of invention. Good job, sir. I love it. That was quick. He was so close to the board, I could have touched him. Good release. Perfect. Very casual. I like it. Good job, sir. Ah, uh, I like it. You start by wanting to catch a fish, everybody does. Then you want to catch more fish, and you want to catch a big fish. Then you need to catch the big fish with a popper on the surface, standing on the left leg. <laughs> and, you know, we made a lighter tippets and all the games, however you want to play the game. Uh, but eventually, the environment you're in and the friendship you create become everything, yeah. really. The Everglades, for example, is not a planet. It's not Pluto out there disconnected. It's part of the whole system. From a drop of water in Orlando or way north to a drop of water in blue water where the, the wahoo and all the pelagic fish are. And we must see it that way. It's interconnected just like all the all the fish are interconnected. What it is today is it's just a shell of what it, what it should be and what it can be if we do the right thing. No doubt. Yeah. And um, it can recover. Oh, it does. Relatively quick. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how well it recovered. Look, a while ago, a year or two years ago, mm -hmm. there were no grass in some areas. I mean, right. no grass, I mean white. White. And grayish white for miles, and in now some areas it, it's come back. Another mandatory break, guys. <laughs> uh, I have that, and I have these colors, mm -hmm. and I have that which I've done very well. The orange one, this one here? Yeah. You're, you're eating shrimp like crazy, so. If you don't mind using one of those. I, don't. I felt so terrible. We go to have a break and I see a fish swim by and, and I make a presentation. No, he's not spooked. Look, there's more coming. Oh. Got him. <laughs> and I stick the first one and immediately I regretted it, but Chico loved it. I didn't mean to outstage you, Chico. <laughs> That's good. Well, my fly is good. Your fly, your fly. My fly was good. He, you know, that's that's the true tale of a, of a real fisherman. That that it, it doesn't matter who catches the fish. That that it's it's about catching the fish and sharing that experience with the people on the boat. That's what makes fishing so great. This isn't just about fishing. This is about economics. The tourism industry contributes nearly $90 billion to Florida's economy annually and accounts for nearly 1.5 million jobs. One misnomer is that we have to invest in our economy before we can invest in our environment, and that simply isn't true. In Florida, investing in our environment is investing in our economy. Everglades restoration alone yields a potential return on investment of four to one and creates nearly 440,000 new jobs. 11 to 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 30 feet. Going to nine, 20 feet. Nine o'clock, 20 feet, yep, right there. Perfect. It's windy, the water's a bit murky, but we can see fish, but it's windy. 
this redfish comes, I want to cast to him the red, make a good cast, but no. He turns around a bet away from me, which is not what I want. He knows it's not what I want, but he's going to do that. Wait, 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 wait. Now, tick, tick, tick. Turn again, same cast, same cast. Nice, wait, 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 wait. I make the cast. I don't want to drive it quick. I just barely move it. He gets under. I move it again and it's past it. I'm through dancing. It's over. Five feet left of you right now, Chico and short. He decides to take the fly anyway. He doesn't turn around to take it. No, no, no. He goes back and takes the fly almost on his back. And we hook the fish. Yes, sir. That's more like it. All right, Chico. That one was all you. You saw him. You presented the fly perfectly. The fish did a backflip to eat back, it. Backflip, I went over. I wanted to make it tough on him. No, you just wanted drama for the show. I love it. That is true. I do that. <laughs> I do that all the time. <laughs> for sure. Well, How we, beautiful they are. They are beautiful. How beautiful. What's, what the real story, though, is that we had to pull out here, way out here, to find the, the remaining turtle grass. And where you find the turtle grass is where you find a little bit of cleaner water, and it makes all the difference. That's right. And turtle grass holds a lot more bait, a lot more shrimp, a That's lot right. more crap than eel grass. And of course, if you just have sand and there's no grass, Nothing. ruin the places. It's ruined, like we had for a couple of years. Now we're starting to get grass back. But the turtle grass that's left, you supplement that with a little bit of eelgrass, and you have areas where this water's clean, and the fish are happier. Absolutely, absolutely. It's amazing what a difference it makes. For sure. Well, I'm very thankful for this fish. I'm glad I was able to watch that go down. That was amazing. <laughs> Let's let him go terrorize some more shrimp. Thank you, buddy. All right. Okay, he's gone. Go he, do he dove under the grass. <laughs> How they can do that, I don't know. Remember back in the day, you would let them go, and they would go in the grass so far that they would disappear, and there was no mud, nothing. They were like down in like a cave or something. They can do that. For sure. They can do that. Okay, let's do that like 25 more times. Okay, I can live <laughs> with that. Mother Nature seems to know what he's doing in the last 100 million years, and we seem to want to take away what we don't like and, and add this and let's kill all of this and then there'll be a lot of that. Nah, make it, make the environment healthy. Amazingly, no exception, it'll be okay. President Harry Truman dedicated Everglades National Park in December of 1947. He captured the essence of why this place is so special. Here are no lofty peaks seeking the sky, no mighty glaciers or rushing streams wearing away the uplifted land. Here is land tranquil in its quiet beauty, serving not as the source of water, but as the last receiver of it. To its natural abundance, we owe the spectacular plant and animal life that distinguishes this place from all others in our country. We're learning that there is no water conservation without land conservation. We need to have the land to store and treat water in the Everglades system like it was meant to be done. Restoring the freshwater flow into Florida Bay sounds easy, but in reality, we need to have land that's protected and dedicated for just that cause. I think that one of the problems is convincing the, in the typical individual who votes to understand that for sure is interconnected. Mm -hmm. 
Don't have someone come up and say, what we can do here? Okay, let's correct this and change this in the Everglades and put a bridge here and deviate the water as if that was the only thing, as if it was one little 5,000 acre of land alone, because it isn't. Mm -hmm. And we know that for sure. There's no arguing. Mm -hmm. There's no arguing that. Even those that are against it are not arguing that. That would be a bad point to argue. We need for the individual to understand that when he votes. In 50 years, what we, 50 years is nothing, ecologically speaking. Right. And what we've done is horrible. horrible. Days where you couldn't catch one, can't quite hook one on fly, I don't care how great you are. You know, the day's not good. Fish, tremendously spooky, and the quality of the water, all the stuff that you know yeah. so well. And so having a, a voice with your, your caliber and with your you know, experience and historic relevance, that, that makes a big difference. And, and so every time we, we can convey that message, then more and more people understand it. And, and the cool thing about when you're edu educated about something, what, do you, what is the first thing you want to do when you learn something? You want to tell everybody you know. And so when you educate one person, you're educating 10. And, True. and that's True. how we have to look at it, True. one person at a time, and we will make a difference. So thank you, sir, very, very much. And you're welcome on my boat anytime. Thank you. Thank you. It was wonderful spending the day with you. Well, we're going to have to do it again, for sure. Absolutely. OK, good. <laughs> I can't wait to introduce my grandkids to these special places. And I know that I will be able to tell them that I did everything in my power to save them and restore them for them and for their kids so that we don't make the same mistakes as the generation before us. It's such a beautifully shot show and the places you go, Benny, um, are so incredible. And I can't wait to see where you and Lo Lucas are going together. I think it's gonna be amazing just seeing what, what you all come up with. But you know, for, for many folks who are watching this show, fishing these types of places in Florida, um, you know, it's on their bucket list. These are like iconic species, um, you know, bonefish and redfish that, that not everyone gets to pursue. Um, and so my question for you, Lucas, is you normally fish in Louisiana. Um, in your experiences with Benny so far in filming, uh, and especially in Florida, have you encountered any bucket list species or locations? And um, then for both of you, talk to me a bit about where you've been so far with the series in Florida, what you've seen, and tell me where you're planning on going. So what specific locations are you planning on going um, this season? Sure. Yeah, one of the things that really makes New Orleans so unique is the fact that you have a world-class city right next to a world-class fishery. Uh, getting to go with Benny and Bay Biscayne or Biscayne Bay and getting to see the city of Miami right there as we're fishing, to me, was a really inspiring moment because it sort of juxtaposes this sort of industrialized, you know, like bustling city right next to an opportunity to basically be off the grid, which is is really a cool experience, you know, and that juxtaposition is something that I've also always found really fascinating about New Orleans. So the opportunity, you know, to get a sunrise coming up and to see something that's awe inspiring, watching tailing bonefish while you're looking at the city of Miami, you know, in the background was to me uh, definitely a bucket list opportunity that I never knew I was looking for. And then, you know, during that shoot, we were able to catch uh, a bonefish that was very close to double digits, which for me was, it was really exciting. You know, it, it's hard sometimes to get excited about fly fishing after you've done it for quite some time, but definitely had the heart thumping whenever we were getting that big boy or girl into the net. Thanks. Awesome. Well, we, um, it was a pleasure to have you down, Lucas. You know, to answer your question, JP, we, we have filmed in this series, both in Hopedale, Louisiana, and in Miami. Um, in Miami, more specifically, we fished in Biscayne Bay on the fly in the skiff. And then we traveled into the Everglades on a bay boat with some pretty world-renowned uh, family um, out of Bud and Mary's in Island Rada. And um, Lucas got to, you know, got to witness really the best of both worlds in South Florida. 
you know, the, the crystal clear, beautiful flats of Biscayne Bay where you're targeting the big three and going into the muddy, you know, brackish estuary in the Everglades where there's crocodiles and mangroves hanging over. And, and um, it was, it was very, you know, it's a black and white picture, but all one estuary, all one system. Um, and pretty amazing that I got to share that with him. But those are the two we, we got to do this year so far. Our, our plans take us into Texas and into South Carolina this year. And I am so pumped to get over there to see those fisheries, to understand what the similarities and the differences between ours and, and to talk about climate change and sea level rise to try to bring our communities together. Yeah, absolutely. And um, as you travel to these other states, to Texas and to South Carolina, do you have any expectations as to what you might see? I mean, um, Texas is quite different from uh, Florida in many regards, um, in terrain and in habitat. Um, there are some similarities probably um, at the same time. South Carolina and Texas probably couldn't be any more different, but that's just me as a novice <laughs> making that assessment. I'm just wondering if you if you have any insight there as to what you expect to see um, and maybe if there are any common threads that you think you might see that you might encounter. Yeah, well, there's there's um, I've been to both and there are some s serious similarities in Texas and Louisiana and some serious similarities in South Carolina and the Everglades. Um, in Texas, there are huge ranging flats with grass, um, luscious marshlands, which are in threat and the reason we're going over there. Um, very much like the Everglades system, very much like Louisiana and Hopedale, where Lucas is from. And then in South Carolina, we have huge tides, eight, nine, 10 foot tides, big oyster bars, creeks with marsh, um, which is very similar to the glades. Um, but all four are being, are completely threatened by sea level rise and climate change. So um, while there are, you know, inherent visible differences, there are so many, you know, drastic similarities that, um, that, you know, you could, I mean, in some of these places, you could probably close your eyes and really feel like you're in the other. Anything you'd want to add to that, Lucas, or um, anything about the experiences that you're looking forward to in any of these places? Well, I mean, you know, Benny's absolutely right. There are definitely some some drastic differences in, in some of these areas compared to others. Um, you know, I'm looking forward to really having conversations with people from those areas and understanding sort of how they're experiencing these these changes due to climate. I, I'm, I'm always fascinated by uh, just how intuitive a lot of these folks are who spend a lot of time on the water and, and how in tune they are with the changes that they're experiencing and, and how detrimental it is. You know, that passion is something that's contagious. It reinvigorates me every time I get an opportunity to talk to somebody from somewhere else. And so, you know, getting a chance to go to see these places to show the similarities despite the geographical differences is really something I'm looking forward to. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, I can't wait to see it when you guys do it. Um, I'm going to move into some more general type questions now. Um, as you may know, and I'm not sure what the case is in Louisiana, but here in Florida, we're in the midst of our legislative session. Um, and there is a suite of legislation that deals with things like resilience or with harmful algal blooms. Um, but I'm wondering if you guys have any perspective as to what kinds of legislative or regulatory changes like from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, you'd like to see lawmakers or agencies think about when it comes to climate change, sea level rise, and where fisheries intersect with these issues. And so just to add some more color to that, I'm thinking about recently when we had a really disastrous red tide event in Southwest Florida, um, the FWC reacted very swiftly to um, close some of the iconic fisheries there, including for redfish and for spotted sea trout or speckled trout. And I'm not sure if they closed snook, I think snook might have already been closed. But um, nevertheless, that's the kind of responsive regulatory approach to um, a, a natural disaster like red tide, which you could argue is fueled by um, climate change and warming waters and, uh, and potentially sea level rise. So I'm wondering if there's any priorities that you have in mind, um, Benny in particular in Florida, Lucas in Louisiana, or either of you guys federally um, that you'd like to see coming down the pike. Sure. I mean, in, in Florida, uh, selfishly, I would like to see a high, a continued high priority for Everglades restoration. Um, we have, we have a ton of potential this year. This is going to be a huge year 
for Everglades restoration and Everglades restoration sets the tone for the rest of the water issues in the state of Florida. And, um, you know, when we have progress down here, it sets the precedent and the tone for issues in Tampa and issues in Jacksonville and, and you name it. Um, so I'd like to see that continued high priority for Everglades restoration funding. Um, as far as fisheries management, you know, that we've seen in the last few years, as you mentioned, FWC stand, step up and stand up and make a stance outside of their normal rain, realm. And I'd like to see more of that. Um, you know, it's difficult to manage a statewide, um, you know, regulation on fisheries when the, the fisheries are so different regionally. Um, you know, that, that swift movement in, in the West Coast was, was crucial. And they were met with a lot of, you know, negative feedback initially. And, but now every single one of those guides is on board because they've seen the drastic change. No one complains about catching too many snook and redfish ever. Um, they, may, they may be a little upset because they couldn't keep a redfish that trip, but they never go, go home upset because they caught 40. You know, and that's the kind of fishery that Florida is known for. That's what people come here for. So there's other places that are being, that are, you know, in, in jeopardy because of a litany of issues that are compounded by sea level rise and, ocean, and, um, and climate change like Mesquite Lagoon, like the Indian River Lagoon. And um, FWC has not acted there. And I, I would very much like to see some, some action there. I mean, there, the fisheries there are in, in dire straits, especially in Mesquite Lagoon. And uh, we have an opportunity to utilize the same issue, the same thing that we've done on the West Coast to save the fish that are left. Um, so I'd like to see some more of that. I think it's effective. I think, you know, regionally and target specific, it is very effective um, and short term helps for the fisheries so they can bounce back. Lucas? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, one of the things that, um, you know, really strikes me as a major change that's needed, you know, in the state and the federal system is the fact that fisheries management is inherently reactive. Um, we're going to have to move into a proactive system in order to make sure that we're ahead of the curve. Um, we can't build resiliency into stocks if we continually react to crisis after they happen. Um, we need to start to address these things now. We need to start to try to look at a more holistic management practice, look at something that's ecosystem based so that we can incorporate all the components that go into a fish's life, not just their life itself. You know, look at, look at the predator prey relationships, look at other opportunities that are going to build resiliency and abundance into our stocks to make sure that we can mitigate through management. On a federal system, you know, I would love to see us continue to uh, work under the very successful Magnuson-Stevens Act. You know, it's still up for reauthorization. I'd love to see that go through, hopefully in 21, 22 at the latest. I think, uh, you know, Huffman, who's working on that bill right now, has done a pretty good job of really trying to listen to our anglers, make sure that everyone's voice is heard and that all the sectors are, are really represented in this new opportunity. I'd love to see us you know, really sort of use that outline and framework in order to move it into a state, uh, state by state, you know, management basis. I think one of the things that the federal government has that the states don't is money, you know, and so whenever we're looking at ways to try and modernize and, and you know, incorporate sort of things like climate change and other, you know, crisis that we're facing with our fisheries management, I'd love to see examples set on a federal level so that it can be, you know, replicated on a state level. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, and yeah, thanks to both of you for those answers. I think um, it'll be interesting to see how the Florida session turns out on some of these key issues. Um, and, you know, definitely it's always interesting to watch what happens with Magnus and Stevens reauthorization and we're always hoping for the best. Um, so moving on to another question, why should people who don't fish um, and maybe even who don't live near the coasts care about the impacts of climate change on fisheries. And I mean, that could be the case in Louisiana or Florida, um, or frankly, it could be the case of a person from Kansas. Why should someone who doesn't live anywhere near the coast or who doesn't fish care about fisheries and care about climate change impacts to fisheries? Um, Benny or Lucas, I'll let you decide who goes first. Well, in, in Florida, tourism is our number one commodity. I mean, that's the bottom line. We we, you know, the numbers are off the charts for the, the amount of people that come here, 120 million people visit Florida for healthy beaches and clean water and, and healthy fisheries, you know, and um, without that, our entire economy crumbles. So it's, it's a connectivity 
that whether you recognize it or not, that exists. And every single business in the state of Florida is in some way, you know, seven degrees connected front to. We might have just lost Benny for a minute there. We'll see if he comes back. But Lucas, if you want to weigh in on that a bit as well, um, and we'll see if we can reconnect with Benny. Um, but Lucas, I see you're still there. Yeah, yeah, I'm still here. Um, yeah, I think that, uh, you know, as far as people caring about the coasts, even though they're not from those areas, I mean, look, a lot of these places are iconic. Like we talked about, a lot of these areas are historical. I mean, you're looking at like Charleston and New Orleans, we're talking about cities that are over 300 years old. And so those those historical and, and architectural um, really landmarks are, are amazing. And, and to lose those would be detrimental to the to the not only the tourism industry, uh, tourism industry that Benny had spoke of, but also to the fact that, you know, those places will be gone forever. And, you know, we are on the front lines and that means we're on the front line of opportunity. And so giving people uh, the, the, the strength and the power that they need in these coastal areas. So if you're from Kansas, if you're from, you know, Indiana, wherever you're from in the middle of the country, you know, standing behind these coastal areas, knowing that we're sort of the first line of defense when it comes to the way that these storms are hitting our coast, the way that it comes to water going down the river systems. You know, it's, it's a real opportunity for people within the middle of the country to really start to understand what it is that we're facing and to see how some of these changes and mitigation practices that we're putting into place here are gonna work for the future because this is global in nature. It is planetary in the way that it's, you know, it's affecting everybody. And so it's extremely important that they understand that they too, at some point, could be affected for a lot of the same reasons. I mean, we're talking about agriculture. There's a real opportunity there for those places to uh, to experience issues with food production. You know, if we end up with major droughts or major, you know, wet times, all of this stuff is gonna be affected by climate as well. And so it becomes extremely important to pay attention. Not to mention 90% of people experience seafood on a plate. So if you're not able to enjoy these shrimp that are coming from the Gulf of Mexico or, or the, you know, the other fish that are coming from Florida and places like that, it means that you're not going to have the opportunity to get a taste of these places because it's going to be gone. And that to me is one of the most important things as we look at opportunity for people who aren't necessarily within earshot of the coast to pay attention to what's going on down there. Yeah, that's extremely well put and um, much appreciated answer. I'm very eloquent too. Uh, and Benny, uh, I'm sorry we lost you for a second there, but you were getting after the Florida blue economy piece, which I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I mean, Florida Florida is surrounded on three sides by this healthy ocean and it needs to remain healthy in order for our economy to remain healthy. Um, let's move on to the next question. Uh, the next question deals with um, your personal sense of optimism or pessimism. So if things remain on track with respect to what you all are currently seeing on the water, um, and we've talked a lot about the, the, the changes we're seeing, um, where does that put our fisheries and our coasts in 20 years? Is it an ugly picture or is it a rosy picture? And what gives you optimism or what leaves you feeling dread? And you guys take your pick as to who goes first. Lucas, I've been going first. It's your turn. <laughs> um, well, I'll, I'll start with the optimism because, you know, pessimism is, is easy for me. It comes naturally. And so I'll, I'll try with the optimist part of it. Uh, one of the things that I've started to notice here in Louisiana specifically is that people are starting to have a more open conversation about climate change simply because they're seeing the effects that are happening on our coast. That's optimistic to me. I mean, five years ago, if you were trying to have a conversation about climate in a room of fishermen, you were probably going to get booed out of the room. A lot of people weren't believing that it was real. A lot of people definitely didn't want to talk about it being man-made. And so addressing an opportunity to fix it was not even a conversation that was going to be had. So for me, that's the optimistic opportunity that I see moving forward. Now, the pessimist side of me knows that Louisiana specifically is not going to be around in 50 years, at least in the capacity that it currently is, if we don't start addressing this stuff now. So we have to make sure that as we're looking at ways in order to try and incorporate climate into fisheries management and any other opportunity that we have to try to fix these areas, we need to stop talking and start doing. And so that to me is really where the pessimist side of me comes in to know that if we continue bickering as to whether or not this is something that's happening, we're gonna find out it'll be too late to fix it. Yeah, Benny. And, uh, and I'll, I'll mirror a lot of that, that sentiment. Uh, in Florida, slightly, we're slightly ahead of you in the sense that 
generally our entire community understands there are issues that need to be addressed. And that's a, a drastic change from five years ago. Um, and is, as early as two years ago, I probably wouldn't be as optimistic, honestly, but we've seen so much progress in the last five years, um, so much forward momentum that, um, that you know, I think in 20 years, we're gonna be in a much better situation. Um, there's legislation that's passing at a historic rate. There's funding that's coming in a historic rate. Um, issues like, like Piney Point are, are terrible, but it continues to further engage a community that's already enraged. And um, when that happens, um, you know, Lucas and I talked about this, when, when things like that happen, you know, and the communities, and the communities engaged, you know, legislation follows and politicians who want to see this through so that they can hang it on their legacy uh, uh, hanger is, uh, is it's happening every single day. And, um, and so while our fisheries are still in decline, generally, I am super optimistic because of all the positive momentum we have going on land. And, uh, and that's where all that change is going to come from on land. Yeah. Yeah. I like something you just said there. And it makes me think about how, if you want to get elected to office in Iowa, you have to care about corn, right? If you want to get elected to office in Florida, you should care about the ocean. And I think it doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or a Republican, the ocean should be a key thing that you as a politician are fighting for. And we can all unite behind that. Um, so I appreciate those answers. And um, I just like to give you each an opportunity before we wrap up here to give any final message that you wanna to convey to get people who are listening to care about fisheries and climate in Florida and Louisiana and elsewhere. Lucas, you wanna go first again? <laughs> um, yeah, final message. Um, you know, one of the things that is really important to me is the fact that you have a real opportunity here to start a national conversation around climate change, that we as anglers have a real opportunity to teach people about what's going on in our areas and our neck of the woods, but to tie that back into a national conversation. I mean, that to me is the most important thing that we are gonna take away after we start to really start having these conversations is the fact that we are all in this together. We all are gonna be experiencing in some way, shape or form that while it may seem local, while it may seem regional, the, the real struggle here is national and global. And so it's that connective thread that we talked about that really ties it all back together for me. It's the one thing that whenever you look at sort of a touch point by touch point, you know, opportunity when it comes to fisheries is that climate change is really the one thing that ties it all together better than any other thing that we have to deal with. You know, a lot of places are experiencing changes and, and maybe there's some differences there that are, are dramatic depending on where you are geographically, whether it be cold water or warm water. But the reality is, is that climate change is gonna make a difference in where you are and how you experience your fishery in the very near future. So for me, the thing that I want everyone to take away is the fact that this is global in nature, it connects us all together, and that if we all scream in the same direction, we're gonna start making change, not only in our environment, but also on Capitol Hill, which is where ultimately a lot of this stuff is going to be decided. Thank you, Lucas. And um, Benny, you want to take us out? Absolutely. That was very eloquently put. Lucas, thank you. Mm -hmm. I um, Obviously, all that is right on the money. But if I, had, if I could speak to every single person watching this, I would absolutely say that you all have a voice. And every single voice is absolutely necessary. Whether you're an outdoorsman, whether you're a fisherman, whether you're a guide, whether you've never seen the water but want to see the water. Your voice is important and valuable. Uh, whether you know one person or a million people, whether you, you stand and talk to you, the people in your house or you stand on a podium and scream it, um, every voice is absolutely impossible, uh, important. Um, and I say that because no one is gonna fight for the water and the land that we love like we will. No one will. Not a single politician, certainly no one in DC, unless we make it so. And the only reason we're seeing progress right now is because we have done that and we continue to do that. Lucas and I, JP, every single organization that was mentioned earlier, um, because we've made it a priority, because we literally stand up and speak up at every opportunity, we've now made it a priority for our politicians to listen and to make it their number one cent, you know, priority and urgency. And um, so every voice is important. And that would, that would be the last thing I'd want everybody to take away from this, that use your voice, no matter what it is, use it. 
Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And um, so in closing, I want to thank both of the captains so much for joining me today to talk about these important issues. It's so empowering to so many people to hear voices like yours on these issues, and it makes a huge difference. So thank you so much for that. And on behalf of Ocean Conservancy, I want to thank the Volo Foundation for convening Florida Climate Week this year and for all of their tremendous support in conserving Florida's iconic environment. Uh, from my organization's perspective, you can learn more about Ocean Conservancy's work by going to oceanconservancy.org, and you can learn more about some of our sea level rise initiatives by going to oceans2everglades.org, um, and that's number two, ocean2everglades.org. Uh, you can book a charter with Lucas by going to louisianalowtide.com. You can book a charter with Benny by going to fishingflamingo.com or checking his Fishing Flamingo Facebook page. And you can learn more about the upcoming Guiding Flow TV series by going to guidingflowtv.com or waypointtv.com. And finally, as I mentioned before, if you have any specific questions about this presentation, you can reach out to me directly at jbrooker at oceanconservancy.org. And thank you so much for tuning in and I hope you all have a wonderful day.